I think that that becomes the issue with gentrification where it's not just about the area improving or becoming better. It's the fact that it becomes better and we're not in a position to reap the benefits of it becoming better. Hi everybody, welcome to the Do You Know Black Creators Kickback. I'm Alyssa. And I'm Darnell, and we're the creators and executive producers of the Do You Know Black Game Show and the Do You Know Black Kickback. In the last episode of the Do You Know Black Kickback, our contestants were asked if they would move into a neighborhood where they weren't wanted, if there were benefits to living there. So I will pose this question to you, Darnell. This was in reference to a question from the show about Daisy and William Myers, uh, who were the first black couple to integrate the suburban town of Levittown. Yeah, so, so would I move into a neighborhood where I was not wanted uh, if I knew there were benefits of living there? Um, I, I don't think I would do it back then. Actually, let me stop. Back then, I may have done it, but it would not have been for selfish reasons. I think in that time, and I don't even think that this was what they were trying to do. I, I don't think they were trying to do it for the purposes of activism. I think they were doing it for the purposes of opportunity, um, which they were, they were completely entitled to. But back then, if I were to do it, it would have probably been specifically as part of the movement. Now, would I do it? Um, definitely not. Um, I, I think about growing up, we grew up in a really unique um, city, town, and uh, I actually, I, I do think we, we grew up in a pretty, like, like a good diverse town. Um, I had a wide range of friends from a variety of groups, um, white, Hispanic, Asian, you name it. And uh, it was a great experience to have that type of diversity around me. But at the same time, there there is still like a segment, there is a component of racism that exists. So uh, I remember one time, my mother and I, uh, we went to a restaurant in what would be deemed, I guess, as a as completely white, <laughs> white part of town. And we walked, we went there and it, it kind of bordered our city, right? It was very close to our city. And I remember we walked into the restaurant. It was really busy and it was completely white. There were probably like 150 just like white people there. And I walked into the restaurant with my mom and immediately we looked at each other and I was like, should we, should we try to find somewhere else to eat? And she was like, yeah, let, let, let's do that. And we turned around, we walked away and it felt like everybody in there just like turned and looked at us. Now keep in mind, these are like, I, I was very involved in the community from a football perspective, all this stuff. So I'm sure like I knew a lot of the people, maybe, maybe they felt a certain type of way about us being there, maybe not. But I do think about that experience. And if that was my everyday experience, I don't think I would be able to take it. So my answer to that question would be no, because if I can deal with that situation, that wasn't as intimidating, I don't know how I'll be able to deal with a situation where I actually had an investment in a home that I could have just up and leave from and find another restaurant, right? Or another home that easily. So my answer would be no. My answer generally is no, but I feel like there's a lot more nuance that I myself today can say that I see that if you would have asked me this question two or three years ago, I would have been completely like, hell no, absolutely not. I think that the difficult part for, for me uh, thinking about it is, would I be somewhere where I'm not wanted? Um, I think there's a difference between whether or not I'm the only one there or whether I'm just uncomfortable being one of the few there. And I think that in the second scenario, I'm now okay with that. And I can explain why. So while if I'm in a, com a completely, you know, lily white town where we are, there literally no one else exists but myself, of course. And I know that there's like 
racism there and I experience it and I know that I'll be uncomfortable there, of course, absolutely not. But what I think I'm more comfortable these days doing is being one of few. And the reason why I think that I would be okay with that is if when we have children, schools are really important to me. The idea of us having access to a really good school is important. And I think that we take it for granted because we both grew up in a suburban area where despite what town you were from, you had access to a really good high school, integrated mixed high school. You know, depending on where you are, I think as I moved to the city for college and, you know, I talked to a bunch of friends and I didn't realize how much, how different our public school experience was being in the suburbs as it was for for my friends who grew up in the city, like their experience, their access to public schools, what they had. Um, and I feel like I don't want my kid to be in a position where they're, um, where I'm forced to put them in a private school for, for me to give them a quality education, what I qualify as a, a quality education. So I feel like I would be, when we look at, when we were looking for homes, right? Again, we bought our home as two single people in our mid twenties, I think at that point, well, late, like late to late twenties. Um, so what we were looking for was completely different. You know, our investment in a home was completely different. We bought in an area based on potential and not based on the future of our children. But, you know, I think as we get closer, because we don't have current, currently have children, as we get closer to it, I can't stop thinking about the fact that would I make the same decision again, have like, had we had children at that point, would I have made the same decision to buy where we were? I can't say anymore that I, I, I would have, you know, knowing what the school district is, knowing the history of public schools and how broken they've been and the fact that, to be honest, I personally do not see there being a solve. Like the issue with American public schools to me is unsolvable at this point. I think I've come to that conclusion that no, regardless of how much money you pump into it, no. And just like Lloyd said, you know, we pay a lot of taxes, especially living in New Jersey, regardless of where you live, you could live in the hood and still be paying crazy amount of taxes. So do I feel like to me that's worth paying into knowing that I still cannot, despite how much money I'm putting in, I still cannot trust this school system to give my kid a proper education. Yeah. So, so it, it's interesting that you say that when it comes to the idea of education. So, so they did speak on that in the episode heavily and there were different perspectives. So you had Lloyd, I, I believe a couple of people there uh, have children. Lloyd is obviously somebody that we know. He went to our high school as well. And uh, I've known him for years, basically grew up in the same apartment complex <laughs> as I did for a period. So, uh, so we had a similar public school experience, but he has actually a unique life experience where he also lived in, in an extremely tough area of Jersey for a while as well. And as we were talking, I remember he was saying how like his mom was like, nah, we got to get up out of here, <laughs> right? Because there were like a lot of issues that, that they were facing as a family. Uh, and this, is, this was in an urban area but really poor school system, et cetera. So, so he ended up leaving. So when he talks about it, uh, being somebody that has children, that is thinking about school districts, thinking about the taxes that he's paying, even though he's, he, I know that he was looking for a house, all these different things. Those are, those are things that he has to think about. Now on the flip side, Sylvia was mentioning the idea of, no, I would just, I would homeschool, I would sacrifice. I do think that when we think about the future, a potential solve where we say, hey, we don't necessarily have the money for a public, for a private school, to send our kids to a private school, but at the same time, if we, and I'm a, I'm a realtor in Jersey as well, so in some, some of the people that I've spoken with, they're like, yeah, I, I want to be in an area that's diverse. So it's like, on one hand, I want a really good school system, but then they start looking at a lot of these good school systems and they realize there's no diversity there. So they're like, oh, I don't want to put my kid in an all white school. So then it's like, well, what's the solve? It's like, okay, well maybe now I have to send them to a private school. But then you're talking about the cost of a good private school. So now it becomes this like really, it's conflicted. So maybe Sylvia's onto something where it's not necessarily the, the way that we used to think about homeschooling 20 years ago. 
now you have a lot of people that think they're they're creating these pods for their kids where groups of parents come together and homeschool their kids together so you know that hey they're with like-minded individuals from like-minded homes like-minded backgrounds and there's like a good influence there and there's a good system maybe that's the solve but when it comes to buying a home obviously school systems are one component of it which we'll talk about more but then there's also a huge financial component to it as well when we start thinking about us as african americans or black americans and our generational wealth our the assets that we actually have or don't have the future of the assets that we have and don't have i i think right now if i remember correctly um, it, it was something along the lines of like right now, the gap in home ownership between uh, African Americans or Black Americans and other races is the widest gap that it's been since like 1968 with the Fair Housing Act. Something along those lines. You can fact check me, but I'm, I think that that's so, so it's something along those lines. So that's another question thing that we have to address. So I do think we have to start thinking about home ownership aggressively, but where are we going to buy? That's like a hard choice when there are these family factors, the quality of life, and there's give and take in either situation. So I guess we can start talking about the give and take in either situation or polarizing situations. The ideal situation is I want the best of both worlds. I want the perfect amount of like diversity and like wide range of people, like, you know, like-minded individuals and like the good neighborhood and all that. But a lot of times you can't necessarily get that. Sometimes you have to choose one or the other. And I think that's important to know is that that comes at a cost for a lot of, of people for you to be able to get the perfect balance that you're looking for. A lot of people are looking for exactly the same thing and they're willing to pay premium for that. And it puts us in a position, I, I read an article before and it was an interesting um, perspective. It was a black woman and she wrote this article um, that was essentially, and she, she included facts and figures and all of this stuff. So I, you know, I know she was accurate in saying this, but I think our idea for black people of kind of keeping up with the Joneses has also driven us into debt. So we, there's no way around it. In order for you to have wealth in this country, there has to be some element of real estate mixed in there. Like the, they, like the, this is studies have proven this. You, unless you have ownership of something, regardless of whether it's your personal property or not, but you have to own something in order to acquire wealth. Like a portion of your your wealth must be made up of real estate. Um, and for black people, I think that for us, like it's just getting over, for many of us, just getting over the hurdle of even owning a personal property is the first step. And I think that we, she, when she was, what she was talking about in this article was that like her generation, her grandparents, their generation really kind of put her family into debt. Like, so the fact that her grandfather and her grandmother, like they bought this house, um, I think this was around, the, I can't remember which crash it was, if it was the 08 crash or there, there might've been like a, a smaller crash prior to that, where their whole, all of their assets were were tied to this house and, and this mortgage that they had. Um, and it ended up ballooning just sort of uh, the same way that um, Olivier was mentioning their mortgage ballooned. They essentially lost all their house declined um, in value. They lived in a black neighborhood. I believe this was 08 when the recession hit. So not only did their home lose value at that point because they were in a black neighborhood, our, na our values don't appreciate as highly as other neighborhoods do either. So that's something that we, we were also very aware of when we were buying our house. We knew that we might be taking, because we live in a black neighborhood, we knew that we would be taking a hit to some extent that our house will not appreciate at the same level as, you know, neighboring communities might. But we also knew there was a lot of potential for buying in this area because it was still affordable. And I think the challenge with 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 black people is when they decide where they're going to live, like what's more important to them. Um, and if they take that risk, sometimes people might put too much stock into saying, I wanna be in this amazing school district. There's a, a district, a couple like towns over from ours where homes are 
800K plus a million more on average uh, for being in this neighborhood. But the school system is amazing. And when you think about what parents will risk to put their kids in that school system, if they can afford it at the moment, if they can kind of stretch themselves to put themselves in that area, are they doing a good thing? Because, hey, now your home has equity, has value, but you're living on a shoestring, right? Like you don't have much leeway to afford a crash happening. You're more like if your interest rates go up or you know, anything and, and the cost of living for you increases, that changes what you can put into the home. Now you might be forced to, to, to make tough decisions or lose your home because you're living at the top of your means. So I think when we were deciding to buy our house, that it was something that was very specific to us where we said, we do not want to live above our means. We know we can afford to live in maybe a better, you know, uh, a, a better neighborhood. But at the same time, we want to still live comfortably and we want somewhere we know will appreciate value. Even if it doesn't appreciate as quickly, we just want to make sure that we're, we're staying within our means. Like not like, you know, some of our friends were paying more, a lot of our friends in the city were paying more for their rent than we pay for our mortgage. And we were okay with that. But, you know, obviously, as you said, we, we took we took a hit in some other areas that we had to like weigh the pros and cons of what was more important to us. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I would say that it the the process of trying to buy a home because I think this is this episode it touches on a few things. It touches on the idea of of uh, something that uh, Shaeja said was we as black people we run away from our neighborhoods. So when we start thinking about that dynamic you have a situation where we have our neighborhoods, oftentimes we're renting in our neighborhoods, right? So you have other people that own, they're renting it out to us, and then we're renting in our neighborhoods, and then we never convert from becoming renters to owners. So owning this house was an emotional experience, not like in a sad, like, oh, we made it type of way. It was an, it was an emotional experience in a stressful way, especially when you grew up in an, living in an apartment your entire life. Right, like I, I think I, I shared a room with my mom until I was like 14, and my cousin slept on the slept on the couch in the living room. Like that, that's how that's our situation, right? And then my aunt had her own room. That was our situation. And then even earlier on, I'm not gonna get into those details, but we had a, my mother and I. We had a lot of financial struggles before we moved in with my aunt, and my cousin. So so that's how that happened. But then when we got this house, there was it was just stressful. I broke down times you don't even know, like just solo, like just emotionally, like between the roof and all this stuff is very overwhelming. So there, there's a lot of that that goes into it. But before we even bought, we made a lot of decisions and we we're very intentional about like the different decisions that we made throughout the course of time. So when we first um, when we first started to live together and we were looking at apartments to like rent out, there were a lot of apartments that we probably could have afforded that would have been a lot more expensive, but we were like, we're, we're okay with like renting a place that's within our means because that that's fine. So we would always find places that were very functional. We didn't necessarily care about being in the, in on the scene, in the crowd, doing whatever. And, and obviously we were together, so we weren't operating as singles in that sense, but like we took a sacrifice there. So the first two apartments that we had we were paying probably 60 to 70% of what everybody else in our peer group was paying. And then we were able to save up a good amount of money um, to be able to think when we were ready to buy a house to be able to think towards that. But when, when Shaeja was talking about, so, so I wanted to bring that up just because it wasn't just about the decision to move to this neighborhood that made it possible. It was a lot of decisions that we were mindful of before we even made the decision that we wanted to buy a house. With that, um, when she talks about people running away from their neighborhoods, you have a lot of um, non-black people who are owning in black neighborhoods, renting out these homes to black people, and then at some point when they're ready, getting the black people out because the black people aren't owning in that neighborhood. And then now they just like flip the house, right? Hike the rent up. And then now boom, you have, you have, a, and this is controversial, but I don't mean it in a controversial way. Like you have a gentrification of an area that we cannot be part of. 
right? Like, because we don't have a piece of that pie. I think that that becomes the issue with gentrification where it's not just about the area improving or becoming better. It's the fact that it becomes better and we're not in a position to reap the benefits of it becoming better. And then the only times that we are in position to do that is if we're willing to pay an exorbitant amount of rent, which a lot of our people aren't able to do. So that becomes like one of the issues. So we're not owning in the areas. And then you have a lot of black people, which we, and we'll talk about this more soon as well, that even us, when we're looking in the area, well, well I'll, I'll actually stop there for a second before I get into that. Um, because I want to give you an opportunity if you have any thoughts on on anything that I just said to express them so you don't forget. I almost already did. But um, I think the idea of I think what people need to understand is where our economy is moving, especially post covid. And that is to being not by choice a renters, uh, uh, a right, a, a, a renters country. Right. So I think at this point, at least the last time I had checked, at one point, the country was 60% homeowners, 40% renters. Obviously, in certain neighborhoods, particularly in in, in black neighborhoods, the renter um, the renter to owner ratio is a lot uh, more skewed towards towards renters. What we're seeing now, and we've noticed this because as we've looked for um, for for second properties for other homes, we've uh, explored various cities and towns, and what's been happening is that. After this, after COVID, there's never going to be another time like prior to the recession when they were literally right after the recession, when people were all losing their homes and you can get a home at a really affordable, at a really affordable rate because there was just so many homes on the market. After COVID, what they've seen, what we've seen is that there are shortages in, in, in the housing supply that cannot be absolved at this point. And with inflation and all of the high costs that are, are not going to go down, all of the the private companies we've found are buying up all of these properties. So now anything after all of these homeowners, the small mom and pop landlords that had to sell their homes, you know, after the eviction moratoriums, you know, were expired and, and they were really behind on rent because their renters weren't able to pay. They are literally just offloading their properties to these private companies. All of these homes that are being built or that are being uh, being sold are being um, bought up by these private companies at over asking price, and instead of putting them back on the market, they're they're renting them out for exorbitant amounts. So not only are renters paying higher rents in their apartments, single family homes are now being rented out, um, and that's a trend that they're saying is is literally here to stay at this point, where most of these private, they, they've done a bunch of stories on the news talking about it, where people are getting driven further and further out from the communities that they've lived in or that they were looking at, and now they're being kind of forced to go back here, any desirable area near a major city or near major resources, those homes are getting scooped up and rented out. So either you're gonna pay these rents that are like way high compared to what you would have paid in your mortgage, um, or you're gonna have to move out further because there's just less land available to you where you wanna live or in the school districts that you wanted your kids to be in. So I think that to me, that's why for black people specifically, home ownership is more important now than ever before. Before there were people who were like, mm, I don't want the hassle. I don't want the upkeep of having to deal with the house. It's just not for me. And I think that's respectable and that's understandable, but I feel like you need to understand that once you're out of the game, like I don't think there's any coming back from it. In the market that we're in now and where the where the real estate is going in the future, there's not going to be an opportunity for many people to own anymore. So unless you're a millionaire or you're willing to pay double or triple, you know, what you would have thought you would have been paying for. So I think that we need to make very conscious decisions now, especially as it relates to black wealth collectively, like regardless of whether I think it's a hassle or not to have a house, would it have been easier maintenance to be in a townhome or, or stay in an apartment? Absolutely. But would I trade it at this point? Especially knowing now that when we got in, that was one of the, 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 the last periods when it was really honestly affordable. Absolutely not. I would do it again in a heartbeat. I would buy more, you know, we could.